I think we can start. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Lama. I'm a member of the LEU Secular Club at LEU. Uh, and today we're hosting this very, hopefully very exciting talk with Professor Mona Halib. So first of all, I want to introduce uh, our guest speaker. Uh, professor Mona Harib is the Professor of Urban Studies uh, and Politics at the American University of Beirut and the co-founder and research director of the Beirut Urban Lab. Uh, she received her PhD in political science in 2005 at the Institut d'études politiques in Marseille. Uh, she has published numerous journal articles, a book chapter, other publications, to name a few. Uh, she is the author of Le Hezbollah of Beirut and co-author of Leisurely Islam, uh, Negotiating Geography and Morality in uh, Shia South Beirut. Uh, she also co-edited uh, Refugees as City Makers. Uh, her ongoing research investigates the public domain, local governance, urban activism, and politics. So Professor, we're very happy to have you here and uh, you may start whenever you want. Thank you for having me, really. I'm very happy to be among um, uh, the audience of a EU secular society or club or whatever you've been allowed to get called. Thanks you very much for having me. And I think this is a timely topic these days to discuss. So I'm um, very happy to do that with you. Would you like to start by asking me questions or would you like me to start to myself. Uh, so to start, um, we are gonna we are gonna pose uh, a couple of questions. But if the audience wants to uh, try to to ask a couple of questions, they can uh, write it in the in the chat. So at first, uh, to start on a general level, whom is urban planning supposed to serve, and how citizens should get involved in the process? Yes, so we start with a general introduction of um, just to make sure that we all understand urban planning the same way. Uh, a note of caution, I'm using here urban planning and urban design interchangeably. So if there are any students studying uh, or interested in the field of urban design, we very much integrate both in our understanding and definitions of it. I mean, I do at least, but there's a, there are schools of thought that integrate them as well. So by definition, in a, you know, theoretical world, urban planning is a tool used by the state to plan and organize and manage its territories. And um, it's been developed with the birth of the modern state uh, as this device through which the state can control its territory, plan it, um, even dominate it, uh, control uh, society in its possible uh, uh, mobilizations against it. So it was created in a way to serve the state interest. And at the same time, it was also conceived with this idea that the state knows what is the good of citizens and hence state is able to the good city, good cities or effective regions. And hence planning is there as a tool, as a device to help organize the territory and protect the public good. So the state is supposedly the custodian of this public interest, the common good, the public good, and planning is there to uh, foster that public good through creating public spaces, efficient road networks, public services, uh, uh, clear cut areas that differentiate uh, residential from um, from commercial, from industrial. So this is really the idea behind it. Over time, and I'm going very quickly over a very, very thick and long and complex history, of course, over time, the role of the state changed and we can observe a major shift in the 1980s with the birth of neoliberalism and the, uh, and the transformation of the role of the state from a welfare state 
towards a state that enables markets and help markets operate better, where planning became, became more and more of a decentralized tool that the state delegated to its regional government and its local governments or its federal government, depending on the political structure. And planning became a tool often exercised by city governments, regional governments that have a big city planning office, planners, designers that operate there, uh, that uh, work also very closely with the private sector through public-private partnerships, and that aims at improving territory at the level of a region or a metropolitan area or a city, depending on the scale, through a variety of urban planning and urban design tools, and with, interestingly, devices that also include the population in uh, decision-making processes. So this differs from a context to the other. Sometimes partition is required, sometimes it's more consultative. But there is an effort to try to think about planning in conjunction with the people it must serve. So that's, if you want, a broad overview of what it's supposed to be, what it's supposed to do. Of course, there's a lot of variations that uh, are related to economic, political, and historical context. But uh, if you're interested, we can go back to it later. OK, so uh, now we're going to ask about how how does how did the Lebanon's post-war model of reconstruction contrast with uh, this idea? Well, as you can expect, we're, um, we're, I mean, let's remind ourselves that we are a colonized country that is born out of a lot of regional and uh, um, international conflicts. So we're very much a nation state that's born with this, with an inherited idea of planning uh, in relation to the French mandate. So uh, so that model that I'm talking about was sort of imported into, into the Lebanese political system and its administration, but very impartially, uh, or, par or, or quite partially, actually. So uh, we have central planning institutions that existed since the birth of Lebanon and were centralized within the state. Uh, Actually, the first Ministry of Planning was born in the, in the early 1960s, and it issued five-year plans on a regular basis. So we had this idea of modernist planning in relation to the early years of the independent state. And it was used, as I was saying before, as to assert the power of this new state over its territory. It was from the start quite unequal, I would say, and unbalanced. And in, in 1962, there was a report that studied the status of development in Lebanon by a French, uh, we see uh, international aid since then, even prior to the civil war and all our problems. Uh, so there was a French um, group that came to Beirut and that studied the status of regional planning and balanced development in the country and deduce that we suffer from a lot of socioeconomic and territorial inequalities where most development was, was concentrated in cities, specifically in Beirut and, and its surrounding, and most of the regions of Lebanon and the, the peripheries of the cities were poorly developed and balanced. So there were... Uh, attempts to rectify this, but they were stopped short uh, by all the conflicts starting from the mid-1960s onwards and then the civil war. And in 1978, the Ministry of Planning was um, dissolved and the Council for Development and Reconstruction, the CDR, was created to replace it with the idea of creating this super a public agency that is not connected to the state and hence should be more efficient in decision making and implementation of policies. And the idea of it was development and reconstruction since, I mean, that was 78. So we had already destruction in downtown Beirut at the time, and the CDR was mandated to rebuild the city center. Uh, CDR was also mandated with coming out with a plan for the whole territory of Lebanon, which uh, only sees the light in uh, the late 2000, in 2009, with the schema director for the 
au développement, euh, le, non, euh, le schéma directeur d'aménagement du territoire libanais de SDATL, de Lebanese uh, Land Use Plan, as it's commonly referred to. So it takes, as you see, like uh, decades for it to happen. So the CDR stands after the civil war as of the 1990s as the main uh, planning unit at the central level, it ends up doing much less spatial planning as it, uh, the Ministry of Planning used to do. And what it focuses on is much more infrastructural development, contractual contracting projects uh, to contractors and to uh, big contractors and firms that build our highways, our our uh, bridges, our uh, connecting infrastructure, uh, dams when they are built, all the big engineering infrastructure goes through the CDR. So that's a first planning agent uh, that operates more as an, I would say, an engineer infrastructural agent rather than a spatial planner by the Then also happen via the Director General of Urbanism, the DGU, which is part of the Ministry of Public Works. Uh, and the, in this uh, ministry, the DGU is supposed to develop master plans at the scale of municipal territories and regions, but it is very poorly staffed. It doesn't have enough human resources to do that. It's like other public, infra public agencies with very limited resources. So its impact on the ground is quite uh, limited. Uh, municipalities are a third, uh, I would say, public actor of planning. They are they have a lot of prerogatives according to the law to act as planners and developers. I mean, developers of their territory. And interestingly, they're they're part of a different public structure, which is the Ministry of Interior. So they depend on a on a centralized structure that links them to the Muhafiz, the Akka in Makan and the Wazir al And as you can imagine, when a, when a municipality is supervised by a Ministry of Interior, it's very much within that logic of policing and militarization that is linked to the Ministry of Interior, which is the country. It's not even conceived as an actor of development and planning, although it, by law, it does have very large margins of maneuver to do that. We can go back to, to the limitations of this. So within this architecture of you know, public institutions, you see the CDR, the, Minis the municipalities, the director general of urbanism, and then have functions like the environment, which goes in the Ministry of Environment, what goes in another ministry. So all these planning functions are quite fragmented among a multitude of public institutions, and it becomes quite hard to, to have a coordinating body of these efforts. You start seeing how the problem is very much a problem of planning institutions and governance, as we call it. And we see how this is well, I would say, representative, represented by one flagship project from the post-war, uh, post-Civil War era, uh, which is the Solidaire project. So the Solidaire project get, emerges in, the early uh, 1990s as a, you know, a, a project that's celebrated as it's going to change the face of uh, Lebanon after the end of the civil war. And interestingly, it's not part of any of those institutions that I mentioned, a special setup, institutional setup is created for it by the, by the Lebanese government and the parliament, which is a private real estate company with specific prerogatives, even more than the real estate company that we have in the urbanism law. So it's, it's created as a special real estate company. And it epitomizes very much that view we have of uh, post-war planning as a planning that happens by private actors away from state institutions and that seeks to advance profit, that looks at land as a through its exchange value, as a as an asset that can be used to create rent. And that model, that economic model that we all are suffering from today, an economic mo model that is not based on productive sectors is also very much seen in this project where you see how Solidaire makes of land and real estate speculation a source of profiteering. And we're talking evidently profiteering for the few, for the political class, the business class, the banks, 
from which capital is circulating, the real estate developers who are able to contribute to this project, the architects, the star architects specifically, the big firms that are able to invest in such projects. So, so you see all the, you know, the issues that we hear about today, what has been termed the oligarchy, the kleptocrat, the klepto kleptocrats. Yes, that that class of, you know, where you have all these networks that go with each other. We see it very early on in the early 1990s when you look at an urban planning project as Solidaire, which is at the same time, you know, a, a beautiful urban design project where we where we that we discuss to our with our students that when tourists come to Lebanon, we take them there, we take photographs there. When our friends come, this is where we go and show them a showcase of a good urban design project. But it's an urban design project that was never appropriated by people, that never served people, and that was not conceived for that. It was conceived to serve a particular class of beneficiaries. So um, um I'll end by saying that, you know, all this, all these dynamics of post-war planning that were put in place from Solidaire to the CDR to sidelining municipalities made of uh, urban planning, I mean, gave to urban planning a very minor role in, in serving people. And urban became a tool that serves profit and serves the reproduction of the sectarian political class because it, through this tool, they were able also to enrich themselves through real estate uh, speculation and and growth, really, uh, growth related to the growth of the city and the urbanization. So in parallel to, you know, the growth of the city in fragments through highways, infrastructure, solidaire, mega projects that happened here and there, we you had in parallel a growth of the city uh, by the middle class and the more uh, the poorer socioeconomic groups that had to find housing, had to access services, and the only way for them to do that was to, to do it in what we call informal ways. Where do you find a decent, affordable housing unit if you want to come and work in the city? You'll find it in informal settlements or next to informal settlements or close to refugee camps or in the poorest areas of the city where you have then urban neighborhoods inhabited by working class. So urbanization grew, informalization grew, sprawl grew, our mountains, our hills started being built in very sloppy ways with no architecture, no urban planning, no service delivery. This is how we have all these so-called suburbs and peripheries of the city from Dawhit Aramun up to uh, Taleb and Rabi with the different classes of suburbs depending on prices of land and real estate developers and profiles of inhabitants. But metropolitan Beirut grew without any provision for public transportation, for soft mobility. So uh, number numbers of cars multiplied. The only way to connect where we work and where we live was through the private car. We had a congested city that grew out of that. No one was thinking it's public space. Uh, very few provision for public space were being offered. So no public space also to serve this growth. We also had uh, dismal investment in infrastructure. As you all know, our streets are not well uh, organized, no electricity, no water provision, no sewage system provision, a lot of privatization in the process where the coastline gets privatized to accommodate for private tourist resorts, uh, public beaches get, get sealed, uh, an extraction of public resources happen. The, the, the political class buys actually public resource and extracts natural resources from our mountains, from our, uh, from our lands. So think about quarries, think about dams, think about all these investments that also extract natural resources that are supposed to be collective common good. So we're in a situation where we're so far from the model I explained at first, where we don't have at all a, a state, a political class, a, a public system that protects the public good. On the contrary, we have a political class, a public system that extracts the public good for its own interest, and the public good is left 
totally unprotected and totally abused as we all experience. And I think I'll stop with that. Sorry, I took a lot of time in this answer, but I see a few hands up. So I'll, uh, yeah. maybe if you want to take a few rounds of questions. Uh, yes, uh, we, can, uh, we can take a few rounds of questions. Just to wrap uh, uh, your beautiful, this beautiful answer up. So basically you touched upon the agents uh, that were shaping the urban development in Beirut. And you also touched upon how the sectarian system really had a great part in creating an unjust um, city where a big schism is found in the social structure uh, be between the part, like the, the people of our city and society. Uh, you also touched upon Solidaire and how its uh, privatized nature uh, really amplified this schism and took out the role of any public uh, power in order to reshape and re re rebuild the city. Um, before we take the two questions, I just want to ask about, uh, did people uh, at, uh, at, the, at the birth of Solidaire, did they try to resist this neoliberalization? And did they attempt to change this city to profit model uh, into a city for people? Uh, did they try to resist? Did they try to, yeah. Yeah, this is a very good question because we need to salute all the people who resisted Solidaire. They're often forgotten because Solidaire is here and we forgot that actually people tried to fight it. Uh, yeah, we'll just focus on actually the urbanists who are, I, I think people you're probably familiar with, Jad Tabet, the, the current uh, president of the Order of Engineers and Architects was one of them. Uh, there was also another urban sociologist, sociologist named Salim, uh, named Nabil Bayhom. Uh, these were sort of the, if you want, the um, leading urbanists and uh, activists that stood uh, loudly against Solidaire. There was also Asim Sal, who used to be one of the engineers and who passed away a few years ago, and George Kurum, the famous economist that you may have heard of and that, that resisted a lot of post-war economic policies. So these four, I'm citing them because they wrote books in Arabic, again, each one from their own position in sociology, urbanism, economics, and architecture against the project, and they held press conference and marches and protests and they wrote newspapers to denounce the project and the way it was happening. So they tried to lobby, to advocate against it. But I would say the force of that project with the presence of Rafi Hariri who was like a, a super, super man savior of Lebanon after the post-war, it was impossible to stop this project. Even, I mean, people lost their assets and solidarity. Some people died out of this because they lost their life savings, uh, their homes or their the few pounds that they were invested in uh, in the land there. Some people named Solidaire one of the biggest scandals of post-war reconstruction. So uh, there was resistance definitely against it and people spoke against it. But at the end of the, the day, when the, our uh, parliamentarians want, uh, went to the parliament and voted for that special law, they it passed in majority and everyone who were, even the ones who were supposed to, to protect the rights of the, uh, of the residents of the original downtown of Beirut, didn't, they were not heard and they were not protected. So there was, there was mobilization, but that mobilization did not translate into uh, much on the ground. There were very minor shifts to the master plan of Solidaire. If you're interested in reading more about it, anyone here, I highly recommend the thesis, the PhD thesis of Hadi Makarim, who uh, gives a detailed story of uh, the making of the Solidaire project and its political economy. So um, uh, it, it tells also the story of these opposition groups. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but, Thank uh, you. Before, um, before taking question, can you explain briefly what did Solidaire do? like their process and the uh, economic... Yeah. Economic. Uh, Salider uh, um, came over, you know, the down, what was uh, referred to, not even as a downtown, as uh, Balad, yeah, the central part of the city. 
it defined actually a boundary to it. It drew a boundary around it and decided that this is its area. It, this, to rebuild, to actually expropriate all this area and to consider it and to transform the, uh, the shares, the property shares of the lands there into real estate shares. So it created a company and there were no more uh, plots of land anymore, physical plots of land. Every owner of a land there uh, became a shareholder. And to, to create that company, Solidair estimated the land at, at its price in, the 19, at, in 1990 at the time. So you imagine a completely destroyed downtown where there's no life, the no man's land that it was then, it was a demarcation. I mean, it was the central part of the demarcation area that divided West Beirut from East Beirut. So the price of the land there was very low after the end of the civil war. So they expropriated the land and provided share compensations to the landowners and uh, and nothing to the tenants. And they, uh, they declared that this is the way the reconstruction is going to happen. It will happen to the real estate company and shareholders will get profit once the shares Will be will be traded at the market, so uh, so people. I mean, in downtown there were very small uh, landowners. You had people in Aswe Beirut, for instance, that owned extremely small shops, like the ones you would see in Tripoli today or in Saida. You know, imagine an old suit and how there are tiny shops. So these people had very small uh, uh, shares of of. Of land, like we call it ashum bil Arabi. So just to so you know, every every acre, every plot of land in Lebanon has 2,400 shares. So some of these people had like 10 shares, 20 shares, and this is the way the property was subdivided. It was subdivided in very small shares. So you imagine these people; they got absolutely nothing. Although they used to have a jewelry shop or a pastry shop in Aswe Beirut they ended up with absolutely nothing. And then you had a company that developed the area according to a master plan where they preserved two uh, heritage, uh, heritage and uh, Place de l'Etoile, and they raised all the remaining heritage from Saifi, from Place de Martyr, from Ghalghoul, uh, from Wadi Abu Jmil, uh, from the area of Zaytuni, where Zaytuni Bay is uh, now renamed, and they transformed the whole wasat of Beirut, Balad, into uh, a, a master planned uh, city center that became the BCD, and that also became known as Downtown or Solidaire. So uh, it's a it's a full transformation of what happened according to. Uh, a financial scheme uh, and a privatization scheme that is the essence of neoliberalism, really. I can go on, but I don't want to just make it a session on, on Solidaire, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, maybe we can take questions now from, uh, maybe from Ali. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so you touched upon a topic that I'm very interested in regarding public transportation, especially, and especially seeing how inefficient our system is and corrupted it is uh, by the political class. I know that we used to have a uh, train system running in Lebanon, a railway system, and that this has been uh, corrupted over time and has been decommissioned. I wanted to ask you, is it still possible, let's say the political ruling classes were removed from a power and we're on the road to prog progress right now in development, is it possible to introduce a metro system without critically harming the current infrastructure of Lebanon? Like, how could you develop something while we're this far along the path? Is it still possible to do such a thing? Uh, do you want me to answer directly? Yeah? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, great question, Ali. It is uh, very unfortunate how, you know, we had a, 
railway transportation system just last week i was on the way to uh, i was uh, in uh, ammi and i was we were driving through dahr al baydar and i was showing my daughter the railway uh, you know uh, traces down from dahr al baydar you can still see them and and it really hurts when you see the what it used to be like you had a train connecting beirut to damascus or a train connecting Beirut to Tripoli, you could imagine what it was like. Uh, for your question, I definitely think it's possible. All, I mean, we're, most of the urban planning problems in Lebanon, they have solutions, technical solutions, engineering solutions, infrastructural solutions, spatial solutions, and we have the expertise for this. The problem is really that you want, as you were saying, you know, if we have tomorrow by some miracle, a political class that wants to work for the needs of the people and wants to serve the people and the public interest, there, there are ways that one can think of to solve the technical issues and the engineering issues related to a public transportation system. A lot of what was built along the railway is also illegal. So you would imagine that if you want to rebuild a, a state, if you want to reform a state, if you want to rebuild a country, the, the first thing I would do is to remove the illegal structures that are impeding on public land. And it takes a bold state, a strong state to do that, but it, this is what it is required. You cannot leave these uh, infractions on public land and, and uh, plan. It's impossible. You cannot keep... Uh, any infraction, infractions on the railway road. And if, you know, there's, I don't know, meanwhile, uh, a residential development or a mixed use development that emerged, which is very difficult to remove, you find ways to go around it, you compensate people, you relocate them, you remove the railway around it, you find alternative routes. There are always solutions to these sort of technical problems. Okay, thank you. I have more questions, but I want to let other people talk first and then I'll ask. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you, Ali. Now maybe we can take the question from Lynn. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you for being here and thank you for this um, discussion. Uh, my question is regarding sectarian policies and how they manifest, uh, urban policies and how they manifest in Lebanon. On. I, when we think what uh, ruling political powers have done so far in Lebanon, it's not surprising to see what our urban environment has come to be. Um, but my question is more regarding solutions, I think, or, or steps that we can start to take in order to um, deal with the situation as is. Um, so as non-state actors, whether that's NGOs or even academic institutions or anyone who's like remotely interested in seeing their country become a livable space, um, what are things that we can start to do? Are we supposed to push for a master plan that gives us direction or do we focus more grass interventions to deal with the issues? I mean, I, I feel like there's too many possibilities and, and not enough focus on um, how these might come together and how the different contributions can help us arrive at something that replaces the, the damage or at least starts to recover from the damage that's been done. Mm. Wow, Lynn, thanks for your question. Uh, I think uh, the organizers wanted to address this a bit later. So I don't know if you want me to move there now or you... or. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's a great it's a question. If it's better up to you. <laughs> no, it was uh, it was coming in the talk, and yeah, so we can start right. this discussion about uh, NGOs and um, municipalities and activism. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe you you know um, before I provide some possibilities for action or uh, you know what can be done, um, I want to say that more and more people in Lebanon, especially since I would say the 2006 war, the Israeli war on Lebanon onward got mobilized around issues related to what you're talking about and what you're asking, what can be done to improve our built environment, 
how can we stop the sectarian political class from abusing our common resources? How can we reclaim the public good? These questions started to develop among uh, uh, people who were interested in cities and their regions and the environment. We had the very strong movement of environment environmentalists since the 1990s that also informed public opinion. And interestingly, in uh, the around the mid 1990s, late or early 2000s, you had the multiplication in many universities around Lebanon of urban planning and urban design pro programs. So it starts with ALBA, then you have AUB, then you have uh, uh, BAU, NDU, uh, LAU, Lebanese University. Very quickly, urban programs develop and you have professors who teach like two, three rounds of generations of uh, architects and uh, other people interested in um, urbanism, not only architects, join some of these programs and uh, start developing what I would call a critical awareness about urban issues in the country. And, you know, they graduate and they cannot go and enroll into public institutions because of everything I said before, there are no public institutions that hire planners. We don't have city planning units and municipalities. Uh, we have uh, 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 architects or engineers that sign building permits. Uh, uh, if you want to work as an urban planner or urban designer in this country, you have to join private offices. We'll have town planning department. There are a few big ones, a few medium ones, very few small ones. Or you have, or some, you know, would graduate and be become more interested in academia and in, uh, in writing about these issues. And some become interested in action. And so they organize and they start making campaigns. And these are the ones we call activists, the urban activists. And you start seeing more and more of those as of 2006, because with the war on Lebanon in 2006 and the destruction in many villages and towns in South Lebanon and in Dahi, specifically in Hat Tahrik. And at the time, the mood was much more aligned, you know, with the resistance and with the sense of defiance that we want to rebuild and we want to claim back uh, uh, the country and support the people whose home were destroyed. A lot of people just flock very naturally to South Lebanon, to Hat Tahrig, volunteer, a little bit like what happened after the blast. Uh, first with relief and humanitarian aid, but some of the urbanists that uh, are around at the time mobilize in, into groups and start assisting the process of reconstruction. Start with that's quite interesting to see that uh, that process of mobilization that happens among urbanists. At the same time, you have people who start becoming interested not only in post-war reconstruction, but in reclaiming public space. So you have the NGO Nahnu that starts its campaign to reopen the, the Hush Beirut Park. And then in parallel, we start hearing rumors that Delhi Tadawshi is going to be developed into a touristic project. And you have a campaign that starts very spontaneously, but by people who want to protect Delhi Tarraushi from this tourist project and who develop very interesting ways of mobilizing against a, a speculative project. And then also in parallel, you have other rumors about a highway that, that's supposed to be constructed in the middle of Ashrafiyye, connecting Spinas Ashrafiyye to Shirki Tel Kahraba and cutting across Marim Khayil, destroying half of Marim Khayil. And you have another group of urbanists that mobilizes against this project. And all these projects I'm telling you about, Hash Beirut, uh, uh, Delhi Tarraushi, and Fuad Butrus, get actually uh, stopped for Adbutros and uh, and Delhi Tarraushi and Harsh Beirut after years of mobilization mobilization succeed uh, Nahnu succeeds in reopening the Harish, the park, the biggest park we have in Lab in Beirut. So these actions of mobilization and uh, organizing and campaigning start forming, I would say, clusters of uh, of groups who are claiming a better city, even in parallel to that, and that's for Ali who's interested in public transportation. You also have groups working on promoting soft mobility and public transportation, others mobilized on heritage and how to protect the heritage of our cities and to prevent gentrification. Still other groups working on affordable housing and how to maintain the right 
to the city by staying in the city and being able to access homes that at affordable rates in the city. So all these topics that are all related to urban planning start emerging and consolidating and pressuring uh, the public agencies, the public institutions to serve, again, people's needs, not petty private interest of the political elite. So you have a wide variety of output here. Sometimes it works, like in the case of Fuad Boutros. Sometimes it fails, like in the case of the Eden Bay Hotel, where mobiliza mobilization even reached to a stage where we had a, a legal decision by a judge to, to prevent the construction of the hotel, but it still gets constructed against the judgment of a judge against the decision of the judge. So we have these main variations depending on the content, the actors involved, the stakes, uh, the power structure, the power map of people in charge, but things start to change. And I think, you know, you probably are all aware of the, the amazing campaign led by Safe Bisri that led to the cancellation of the project, of the funding of the project by the World Bank, which is another major win in that and these uh, stories of mobilization. So what is there to be done? In my humble opinion, more organizing, more mobilization, more pressure, more advocacy, we cannot do without those. But at the same time, what's quite interesting is also the experience of Beirut Dinati and running for municipal elections that's worth noting. Because here you have a, a platform of candidates and uh, a network of activists that came together that included a, the cluster of urban activists I mentioned, but also many other activists from human rights groups, democracy, uh, democratic uh, groups, uh, political groups, uh, environmentalists too, LGBTQ, feminists, they all came together around Beirut Madinati, and you see how this coalescence of different activism led to this action of wanting to reclaim a, municipal, a municipality. And part of Beirut Madinati's program was an urban program. What will we do if we take Baladiyat Beirut? How can we transform the city and make it a city that serves the people? So I can talk a little bit more about this if you want, but you see that, you know, there were also attempts by these urban activists to engage in, uh, in political elections and representation and trying to reclaim a municipality to serve the rights of its people in the city. I mean, I think you, most of you live in Beirut or come to Beirut or study in Beirut. And I think the worst municipality we've all seen, we would agree on, is the municipality of Beirut. Any other municipality outside of Beirut works better than Beirut. You go to Sinilfil, you see what the municipality is doing. It's trying to provide its people something. You go to Jezin, the same. You go to Saida, the same. You go to Gbeiri, and you see the same. I mean, so you see that there are possibilities for municipal, the municipality. In the case of Beirut, it's completely locked by the national uh, political sectarian uh, lockdown that makes uh, you know sectarian political parties uh, paralyze any form of public action, I would say. But no master plan. Actually, this is what I wanted to say. You mentioned <laughs> you mentioned the master plan. The ma I mean, we have a very nice uh, land use uh, uh, plan, which is the, the ATL that I mentioned. So that's already there, and it has been developed by amazing people according to a very interesting methodology. This this would be, if you want, sort of the vision for development for Lebanon. It needs to be operationalized through regional plans and, and then through strategic plans. Now, uh, urban planning operates much less through master plans because by the time you issue a master plan, it's most of the time obsolete. And uh, it's much better to operate through strategies that are more um, uh, focused on at a neighborhood scale, on an area scale, on a place scale. So we're much more as planners now working through area-based approaches, neighborhood-based strategies, placemaking strategies, where we, we identify an issue and we work more surgically than, you know, taking always taking the master planning approach, which is now quite obsolete as a tool. And uh, it's a quite rigid tool to work with. There are much more dynamic ways of making the city and improving it. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you.
So, sure. uh, if Rami Hademi wants to uh, talk and say his question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Rashi. Uh, I want to ask about the solidar. Is it is it solidar to blame about the destruction of the urban tissue as the social and economical dynamics that used to exist in the city center? Or is it the master plan that was given to Solidar to apply out work on by the government? Uh, Solidar was assigned the task of developing the master plan. So uh, there's no responsibility for the, go the government delegated all responsibility for development and reconstructing downtown Beirut to Solidaire, which commissioned uh, architects and urbanists to develop a master plan. So their responsibility for destruction is full. Yes, fully responsible. They're fully to blame. Uh, okay. And we should hold them accountable. That's mm -hmm. uh, another thing that uh, I think is important to, to keep in mind that Yes, they're fully to blame and uh, they should be held accountable. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, thank you for your answer. Um, but I want to go just a bit back since we started talking about mobilization and urban activism. Uh, we can continue with a couple of questions uh, and leave the remaining time after for the audience questions. So uh, you touched on the topic of NGOs and civil society and the Beirut Medirati campaign meant to read the institution themselves. Um, you went into details about the campaign specifically, but can we talk generally about the role of municipalities in urban planning and what's the importance of decentralization in planning and governance? Mm. Yes, thank you. That's a good, very good question. So uh, we have a law for municipality in Lebanon, Law 118, which provides large margins of maneuver and a lot of prerogatives to municipalities. So we have uh, this law sort of puts municipalities as decentralized units, and they're supposed to be responsible for the territory they administer, and they are able to require a master plan for it, uh, and for that, they can go to the DGU, to the Director General of Urbanism, and ask it to, uh, to have a master plan for them. They can also, if they have resources to do it, or if they secure resources to do it, commission someone to do a master plan for them. They can partner with institutions in Lebanon or abroad to do this type of work to make an assessment of their territory, for instance, and to find ways to improve their territory at the spatial level, at the urban level. So they, they can do all of this. Uh, they mainly operate through collecting taxes, and this is a limitation of their work. They cannot levy new taxes. They are bound by the taxes imposed on them by the law. So depending on where they're situated geographically, these taxes would vary because one of the most important taxes as a source of revenue for them is the tax on the, uh, uh, that comes from building permits, from building actually, and from the commercial establishments and the tourist establishments in their sites. So if you are in a municipality that has a lot of restaurants and hotels and uh, an active leisure sector, you'll get more taxes than a small municipality that's much more tranquil and it doesn't have these services. So uh, in practice, today in Lebanon, we have more than 1,000 municipality, which is huge for the small size of the country. Uh, the, most of these municipalities, so you maybe only 50 of the 1,000 are actually able to operate their roles because they're larger municipalities with some revenues. Part of the revenues of the municipality also comes from the central state, that these are what we call transfers. But given the central, I mean, that's a very complex uh, um, setup that would need a different session to be discussed, that issue of fiscal fiscality of the municipality. These transfers of the state never come to the municipality as they should. They are very erratic. Sometimes they are transfers, 
sometimes they're not, and municipalities are, do not always know what to expect. So in some, so I don't take a lot of time explaining that. Uh, what we can say is that we have on paper a, decentral, a relatively decentralized system of governance, but in practice, we have a system of governance that actually re-centralizes power in the hands of the central state. So we have much more deconcentrated municipalities, what we call like municipalities that serve the central state rather than municipalities that operate as development and planning units. There was a decentralization law that was supposed to give much more power and fis fiscal power to municipalities. And that's also supposed to create regional councils. So we'll have a, a middle tier of government in Lebanon. So we would have Baladiye and then Majlis Qada, uh, a regional council that would take care also of planning and that would allow the national master plan we have to operationalize at the level of the Qada and then the municipality. So that decentralization law was studied by a committee for years. It was debated for additional years in the parliament and it was never uh, it was never put on the agenda of the parliament to be voted upon. So all the labor that was invested in that committee and the development of this law, like many other laws, has uh, has been put to the side. So we are in a situation where on one hand, you feel municipalities offer interesting opportunities for development and for also mobilization. And you can you could see that if more, you know, independent uh, collectives and organized groups with uh, secular mindsets or mindsets that are uh, more focused on people needs and less on profit and that are not connected to the oligarchy would take municipalities, you could see that as an interesting uh, uh, experiment. And this was tried in 2016 by a number of platforms. We, In addition to Beirut Madinati, there was Baalbak Madinati and Nabatiye Madinati and other independents that run for elections. And sometimes they managed to take some seats in municipal councils. It was more successful, I think, these attempts, even in terms of pure scores, uh, not necessarily in terms of seats, than what we saw in the legislative elections. So you do feel that the local level could be interesting to, to uh, invest in. But given the electoral laws in Lebanon, given the fact that most of us do not vote where we live, we have to go back to the village where our grandparents were born to live. And if I'm married to someone from another village, I'll have to go and vote in their, vill their village or town or city. As long as we have this electoral uh, architecture that is controlled by this very oligarchy, the whole ability to, to think about municipalities as opportunities for political change. For me, I used to believe in it much more a few years ago, but now I have much more doubts about its possibility. Well, this doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but I mean, we're, uh, we're more alert to the limitations this, this poses. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Frim Trabulsi would want to, uh, to talk. Hi, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this, all this very, very interesting information. Um, urban planning is actually a, has become a recent passion of mine. Uh, it's, uh, I read uh, your urban securitization paper with Dr. Wunav was, and that completely inspired me to seek to pursue a, a master's degree in urban development and management. So thank you for that. Uh, my question Hello. is, do you think that redesigning the urban plan of Beirut is a necessary first step to be taken in order to change the atmosphere of the city that is ha like highly tainted by intense urban uh, securitization, uh, a lack of feeling of inclusivity by the different communities of, of, of the city and of this country? And uh, yeah. So which urban plan are you referring to? The, our master plan dates to the 60s or something. We don't even have a master plan. It's more of a zoning plan. Whatever one then uh, is understood to be the urban plan that we exist in today. Yeah, it's actually a good question because it allows me to say that there's no real urban plan. We, what we have is a zoning plan which subdivides the city in, uh, in areas uh, that 
to which uh, coefficient of exploitation is uh, associated. So you, so it's about how many floors you can build, how many square meters on a piece of land. Uh, so it's all about you know how to transform land into a profitable asset. It's, there's nothing related to urbanism in it. So uh, it's not even we need to change the, that plan. We need to, uh, to, I don't want to say make new ones because, and that's an interesting to say, uh, the municipality of Beirut did commission, again, French planners. We have, a, I mean, a historical relationship with French planners to do what is referred to as the Plan Vert of Beirut. And they also commissioned other urbanists to do uh, what is referred to as the soft mobility plan for the city of Beirut. Have any one of you heard of these plans here? Apart from uh, the people I know in this list who were our students and who would know about it. Anyone heard about Plan Vert or know that we have a green plan for the city and the soft mobility yeah. plan? Yeah, well, is it, does it include the snake uh, across the... The what? Does it include that solar power snake, solar panel no, snake? No, this is the country. No, this one is, a, I think it's a Gibran Basil project, this one. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, this is, remember. No, it doesn't, it's just, it stops on the Beirut, on the limits of municipal Beirut. So these two plans, actually, if there is an advocacy campaign to implement them, our city would get improved by, I mean, the quality of life, the livability standards of our everyday life would improve enormously. So these plans have been commissioned. Even some of them have reached a level of execution details, but nobody is executing them. And if you go and ask the muhafiz, why is, aren't you implementing the plan? Well, he would tell you, oh, let's ask Jamal Aitani. And if we go ask Jamal Aitani, he would say, no, it's the muhafiz, it's actually not with me. I want to implement it, but they, he doesn't want me to implement it. And you end up, you know, with these, sterile discussion about it's not me, it's him, it's him, it's not me. You know, it's pretty much like what we hear now. Uh, why is it that we don't have electricity? I don't know, it's him, it's not me, they didn't pay me. It's like, I feel like, you know, it's a, a kid's fight. I mean, I think children are more mature than the type of narrative we get. So we, we have these plans, Reem, and I highly recommend that you look at them. Uh, I think we we link to them in the at the Beirut Urban Lab website. Uh, we have one of our interests in the in the Urban Lab is what we call activating public space in the city, where we mapped all the public spaces in Beirut in municipal Beirut, and highlighted also what is referred to as unbuildable lots. So the lots that cannot be built because of the building law, and our approach to improving the city and livelihood in our city and, uh, and the quality of life in our city is to think about these existing open spaces, be them private or public, and think about how to use them through temporary transitory usages and activate them through projects that are productive, that are uh, ecologically sound, that are inclusive, that could be linked to uh, uh, infrastructure that could be linked to uh, productive investments, to rethink uh, um, environmentally responsive uh, interventions. There are a lot of possibilities to think of. So I would advocate much more an approach that works with greening, public spaces, along the and of mobility, rather than a master plan in that sense. Or, so more of an urban plan, but that, that works on public space connections in relation to culture, economy, and, um, and perhaps even affordable housing. Now with all the vacancy we have in the city, not, not now, I mean, even from before, uh, affordable housing can be really thought of in relation to vacancy. And Thank abandoned. you so much. You're welcome. So now it's. Uh, but do you think? Uh, sorry to continue on this matter of affordable housing. Would you would you think that we need to build new projects where we has where we have these projects that are empty in downtown, all these skyscrapers, and maybe work on the existing in order to fulfill the needs, which would be the answer in our case of Beirut in general. Absolutely, I totally agree with a strategy that would be 
linked to existing empty stock of apartments and thinking how to repurpose them, use them, squat them. I mean, there's a squatters movement in Europe that uh, squats empty uh, uh, vacant uh, buildings. And I don't think we, we would ever see that in uh, Beirut today, but there's definitely something to be done with that. Absolutely. Okay, uh, now it's uh, Abbas Saad's turn. Uh, if, he, if he's not here, we'll take Felix. No, or we can uh, we can read the, his question. Uh -huh. No problem. Mm. The solidarity model of the confiscation of public and private property. That's yeah, that's him. Yes, yes. Be implemented through the existing state planning institution. Yeah, but uh, Akid, yes, I understand his question now. Uh, the public. I mean, public planning institutions have the right to expropriate private land for public use. We have this law. It's the expropriation law. It's the MLIC. So uh, absolutely, they can do the same. The DGU can do the same. They, are, they have plenty of tools through which we can plan. We have a relatively good urbanism law planning tools it can uh, implement to develop and plan its territories and neighborhoods, including expropriation, Stimlik, including uh, the Mufaras, regrouping lots together and redividing them, including a real estate company that actually retains the rights of uh, landowners, uh, as well as a public agency. There, there, these are all planning tools that are devised in the planning law that we have, which is a relatively good law that provides state agencies, municipalities with a, a good enough set of tools to operate with if they wanted to. What we miss are more dynamic tools like strategic planning, uh, uh, tools that are missing from the urbanism law. And that's something that needs definitely reforming. Yes, okay. So uh, if we can get Felix. Uh, I don't see his question in the chat for. Um, okay. Okay. It's fine. Do you know? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to read her question. Uh, yeah. Can you explain the legal aspect of the privatization of public spaces? Is it legal for the state to sell a public property or, or to rent it? If yes, is there any legal limitation on this public property rents? Uh, for example, like a maximum period uh, uh, rate fixture and how are these legal structures uh, been avoided till now? Mm. It's a great question. I don't know to what extent I can do it justice. It would require someone who knows the law much better. But uh, uh, roughly speaking, yes, the state is able to rent its assets to whoever it sees fit. They do a contract with them. And this is how most of our maritime uh, properties, uh, most of the seacoast of Lebanon that is privatized has been developed through a rental contract between uh, the state public agent who owns that land and the developer of that land. Uh, typically, they do long-term leases that could go on for 20 years, 30 years, sometimes more. So they define that period and it's renewable. So they can renew them as well. And in exchange, they get some money out of it. So uh, this is, uh, this is, I would say, not illegal. This is legal, but one could argue that it's illegitimate because the these public assets are supposed to be uh, public assets. They should be uh, common good. And in that sense, the public who's close and who benefits from these public assets should have a say in these decisions. So uh, legally, one could argue that the state institutions are not supposed to take these decisions without reverting back to the public who uses these public lands. Evidently, we know that this happens without any consultation. And most of the time, people just 
realize that this public area has been privatized. Um, in reg with regard to sale, uh, there are all also shady operations through which public land has been sold. Delia is an example, actually. Delia used to be a mashia, and it was sold to, to Rafiq Hariri through an operation that's not clear at all. And if you're interested in the details of that, Abir Sa'su has written a very good article about this in Arab Studies Journal that tells the, the story of this confused legal setup. Most of the time, this would be accompanied by you know, a, a shady, opaque situation that one can research and identify and eventually build a, a, a case against. But it would, uh, it would uh, be linked to situations of corruption, involvement of politicians, businessmen, and banks. Most of the time, you'll have that architecture of power, very much similar to what happened in the port uh, and that led to the, to the criminal explosion of the blast, I mean, of the... Uh, nitrate ammonium that happened in August. Pretty much the same architecture. You would have it around every plot of land that used to be public and that got sold to a private, uh, to a private. There are a lot of stories of that. In, in the south of Lebanon, municipalities are selling their mashiaat to, to private people. We don't know who, but they've been, uh, it's been reported in the news. Uh, mashiaat are, uh, are common, uh, are real commons, actually. They're communal assets that are owned by Ahl al -Baldi. It's a great thesis topic, by the way, if anyone is took, uh, looking for a thesis topic, working mm. on the sale of mashiat is an excellent uh, topic to be researched. No one has worked on it before. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 can I ask my question? Uh, Yes, it's your turn. So uh, my question for you, Dr. Harib, today we have an, an obvious problem, and maybe it's a consequence of the civil war, maybe it was amplified by the civil war, but we have this uh, religious geographical divisions that we see, whether in Beirut itself, it's a mirror of the whole country, but we can see that the, the, the country, as small as it is, it's divided by religions and, and by religion in general. And it's a big problem for the small country. We notice it that when you go to a village, you have a picture of a martyr, and you know that this is a village that towards the, that is towards this religion, or that you have a a cross on the beginning of the village, or the center is the is a church, or the center is a mosque, and and these are part of the urban planning culture that we have. And for a country that preaches co-living and there's not a lot of co-living. There's not a lot of interaction. The only place for interaction is the Beirut city center, which no one uses, which has no soul. And, and I would love to know your opinion about this, uh, this, mm -hmm. this uh, sort of divisions that we have. My yeah, it's a good question. It took time for sectarianism and space to, to come to the discussion. It's a good sign, actually. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're totally right. We are uh, we are very much uh, a country of contested cities and, and divided cities and fragmented cities. This has been uh, well, I would say, discussed in the literature on urban studies in Beirut and Lebanon. And yes, it's certainly a remnant uh, to the to the civil war where you had forced displacement of populations that uh, uh, removed certain groups for cert from certain neighborhoods and brought other groups to other neighborhoods. So you had waves of displacement that reshuffled the city, especially Beirut and its environs, and where you, you had more homogeneous neighborhoods at the sectarian level. And mixity, as you rightly point to, uh, uh, is relatively rare to find. Um, although it's not as rare as we think, there's... Uh, uh, I mean, proportions differ, but we do have uh, towns and villages and cities where you have a mixity of sectarian groups. I'm not, I'm, uh, it is dominated often by one group over the other, but the mixity is sort of there. Uh, and we also live in a, in a context where, you know, religious identities and sectarian identities have been essentialized, have been claimed by political groups. This is the way we create fear from others. And, um, you know, 
putting this in the territory as a as very much a staple of this group, marking the territory, putting signs on it related to religious signs or political signs or uh, martyrdom signs, which are a mix of politics and religion, is quite common. And we see it, as you say, almost everywhere to claim territories and the boundaries. This is my turf, this is your turf. And uh, space in Lebanon is quite, I would say, marked in that sense. On this topic, I really advise the book of Hiba Bouakar for the war yet to come, which uh, which talks about this beautifully and also talks about how urban planning is a tool for furthering sectarian divides. And I would also add that all the urban policies after the post-war reconstruction were not done in ways to revert the divisions that were, were done during the civil war. On the contrary, they were done in ways to, to uh, consecrate further these divisions. So the highways I mentioned earlier, they came on the boundaries. A very good example is the way Dahiyat Beirut is separated and distinct from uh, from Beirut itself. It's where the highway connects downtown Beirut to the airport and cuts through the the um, and cuts through the uh, Dahiyat Beirut in half to make sure that you don't get to see Dahi and you don't even get to uh, feel curious about driving through it. And then, you know, we have conflicts and wars and the ghetto claims itself as a ghetto. So Hezbollah consecrates its domination over a place like Dahi. And I'm talking about as I work, but you would see the same in Burj Hamoud or in Kisarwin or in, um, uh, or in Tari Ejdide. Uh, or in Shuf. So you have these sectarian territorialities that are a, a major component of uh, of this country's urbanization. What can be done? A lot of things. A lot of interventions at the urban level can be done to remediate this, to reconnect uh, places that are separated physically. Placemaking can play a major role in this, public space too. Um, Economic interventions can happen. We are a, a very small country. Most of us live in a place and work in another place and go repair our cars in a third place and have friends here. And, uh, uh, and you know, we have connections as humans. We have connections through our work, through our uh, leisure, through our residential uh, places that make us much more connected than we, we, we are told we are and we can be. Uh, but I would say there are no force that goes in the direction of stitching, reconnecting, uh, re, re, uh, bringing together or creating opportunities for people to meet. On the contrary, what is being practiced is more ghettoization, more fragmentation, more disconnection. And that's also a, a, a policy. It's a policy to do that. It's an urban policy. It's a spatial policy. It's a political tool as they're using it. Uh, Absolutely. They, uh, yeah, know. urban planning. Uh, I mean, I did a PhD in political science largely because, <laughs> you know, the more I was uh, discovering urban planning, the more I was discovering how of a political tool it can be. Absolutely. Exactly. And for the, I, I'm hearing a lot of questions concerning how to develop Beirut or the master plan of Beirut or how to help what, what I think is, there's a lot of uh, centralization in Beirut, and it's it's not a lot. It's not a, it's a problem to a certain point. That one of the problems post civil war that they put all the money, all the budget of the country in one area, which is solely there, the downtown district. But they never had a global or a bigger view of of Beirut in general. And now we're doing it at the same time for the whole other places of Lebanon with Kent, Tripoli, Akkar, and Beka, or uh, or all the other places that are not being, uh, we're not thinking, it's a small country. I don't know why we always think in Beirut, the district, more than with uh, or Lebanon in general. Yeah, yeah. you point to a very uh, correct uh, qualification of the problem that unfortunately dates uh, deta decades back. If you remember when I mentioned that French study in 1960, the IRFAD study, it pointed to that and it called the problem at the time, it referred to it as a macrocephaly. You know, Lebanon as a corpse, which has a too big of a head, Beirut being that head that's too big, and it pointed to it as a source of major instability in the country. 
So there's no interest in investing in peripheries and regions and do more balanced development, more decentralized planning, more regional connections. Uh, although this is, you know, the basics of uh, regional planning, and this is what the Lebanese National Land Use Plan aims to do, I I strongly recommend that you take a look at it. It's on the if you put uh, schema directeur de l'aménagement du territoire libanais, you should be able to get it. It's an interesting document to look at because it go it tries to rectify that uh, over centralization in the city and find ways to rebalance territory into what they call uh, relay centers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the book by Heba Akar was the the war yet to come. Yes, it's uh, in the chat. Lin oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, a link. Thank you for the intervention. Now, I had a tiny link to our national physical yeah, master plan link. that yeah. I've been mentioning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna take uh, one more question from Ali H. About Shahidu. Uh, Hamid, hi. Uh, I asked in the beginning a question. I yeah. have another one I wanted to follow up regarding what Reem was talking about. And also you touched upon it in a different way now. As you were saying that uh, public development was used as a political tool. Uh, this is like apl applying this concept in the worst possible way. The best possible way that I know about it is through the use of what they call functional aesthetics, where the beautification of an uh, of an area like its urbanization could enhance the area in a way beyond just uh, uh, like looks. They use this in Japan and in other Eastern Oriental countries where they use these musical roads that play uh, beautiful notes if you drive over them at the proper speed. And it's well documented that beautifying a neighborhood is uh, useful in, de crime <laughs> in decreasing crime rates. And in uh, overall, uh, people rank the beauty of their city as more important than its safety or its cleanliness. If you had the power now to start implementing these types of reforms in Lebanon, where would you begin? And what would you consider to take priority uh, predominantly to get the ball rolling? Definitely not in those policies of beautification, that's for sure. I think uh, we have a situation of sorted inequalities that, you know, we need to uh, start addressing that core systemic issue. And uh, the built environment presents very interesting opportunities to tax people who own um, apartments, who own land, and uh, to create through this taxation funds through which you can provide decent, affordable housing and services to vulnerable groups. Uh, so I would start with the basic of housing, basic services, infrastructural services, livelihoods, job opportunities. You know, so it's not the discourse of an urban planner, but <laughs> you know, urban planning comes at a very later stage, and you need you need a city that where people have a job, have a roof above above their heads, uh, have access to decent education and health. And then you can think about how to improve their quality of life. So in parallel, I do a little bit of placemaking. I, uh, I, uh, I make sure there's a soft mobility system um, that works. We cannot, I would say, single out one sector and work in it. If I want to work on housing, I have to think about jobs because they're linked. And if I want to think about both, I have to think about mobility because people need to, to go from their homes to their work. So it's an integrated approach that one needs to favor. And in that sense, urban, urban planning is a very interesting tool because it brings together all these different sectors which need are interdependent. You cannot just focus on one without taking care of the other. So it's a very hard question, Ali. That's unfair <laughs> to, to be able to prioritize one you know, entry point. So my question will be more about you know, thinking about an integrated approach that would be much more about uh, providing the basic services and then moving ahead with approaches that are more spatial and more about beautification. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna rephrase Rami's uh, question uh, in order to, to ask basically a question that I wanted. So, uh, 
with everything that is happening uh, in the economic crisis and in contrast to like solidar being basically isolated land can can the economic crisis be opportunity for, uh, for us the people to take back uh, solidar solidar and like the the no man's land yeah that's a great question and it's a great horizon to think of i uh, i think i mentioned when we were talking together about how in the uh, in the days where we used to have teachings uh, uh, in downtown during the october 2019 uprising there were discussions among uh, some of the anarchists to nationalize uh, solidar and to think about how to claim it back as a space for everyone. Uh, you know, very much the action that happened at the time of, of uh, uh, reappropriating the egg, uh, uh, entering into the Grand Théâtre, occupying uh, Martyr Square, occupying even the ring, you know, all these manifestations of wanting to reclaim the public spaces and Solidaire and reclaiming the city center uh, as our city center, I mean, there were chants and there were graffitis about this that are wonderful and that speak much better to this than I do. But definitely there's a huge opportunity about, about that. So there is supposed to uh, start paying taxes to the municipality of Beirut, which I don't know at what date, I forgot, but its mandate uh, where it was exempted from paying taxes was supposed to end at some point. I don't know if the municipality renewed that mandate or not. It is also support, supposed to give back to the municipality of Beirut the management of its public spaces, meaning the streets and the public spaces inside Solidaire. So at the very least, if that's given back to the municipality, then you can think about Beirut, the central, the central areas of Beirut being reclaimed by people like any public space in the city where you would have... Uh, the possibility of, uh, of I don't know, uh, uh, food carts circulating, without having safety stop. Even homeless would be able to go and, uh, and um, uh, or beggars would be able to walk within the streets of uh, downtown Beirut. So there are real opportunities there and it's very important to be aware of them to, and to think about how to integrate them into reclaiming not only the city, but the right to a, to a place that can connect people, as Rami is saying, and that can be reclaimed as a collective by every Lebanese and non-Lebanese who resides on, on this, um, in this country. So there are a lot of opportunities there, absolutely. Uh, sorry, can I say something, please? Yes, yes. Uh, talking, talking about uh, Solidar now or the center. Uh, in, the, in the days of the master plan, there was a, like a, ga a gap or separation between the social life of the surrounding of the BCD and the BCD. Uh, and it shows mm -hmm. up now that the BCD is a no man's land or a very an few social yeah. life exist in the BCD. Uh, uh, beside the claiming the social spaces as the streets of or the sehad that already exist, that now they are under the municipality uh, administration. But uh, the municipality it goes back to the problem of Muhafiz Rais Baladi because uh, the, the Baladi is the legislative and the Muhafiz who is Munafiz. Uh, the investors in Solidar are the same people in the politics class. Sorry, um, the, at the same time, in Solidar are the same people in the. Uh, they they are not to to give the. the and I want to do Is it just me? Hello. I'm be at Rami. Okay, I'll, I'll say it again. Okay, the, okay. the public spaces as the streets or sahat are already under the, the administration of the municipality. But with the conflicts of Muhafiz and the Sultan that exists, 
Um, the municipality is not allowed or can't do much thing about these places as doing like events that attract different social classes because with the influence of the investors that are already in the Sulta, they won't be able to do it. So then we do not to re, re give the importance or the role of a central district and city on the national level of the It's, it's a major challenge, and I totally agree with you. This needs to be a, a center that operates at the economic level, the financial level as a center, at the cultural level, at the commercial level, and none of it is there. And one, and one would really need to think about how to reimagine downtown to be claimed by multiple social classes in a way that it becomes a collective. There, there are possibilities, of course. I mean, there are possibilities of thinking about how to cre recreate a street life and a commercial life that's not only exclusive and for a certain category of population. What are the possibilities to do that? How to invest in a cultural net of those, bring a variety of people to downtown Beirut. So not only cultural events that are, uh, you know, that attract a certain category of population, but that are much more inclusive in their, in their functioning. Uh, same thing about even affordable housing, how to rethink about the city not being this exclusive gated community that is only uh, affordable to a very small minority of people and expats who spend very little time in these places that um, they have invested in. These are real questions. I think that Solidaire is one of the most difficult places to be reappropriated because of its uh, because of the way it was built and how it's uh, you know it has uh, produced in it these env this environment which is quite alienating to most of us and that makes people don't feel that this is their territory, that they can appropriate it. It's a form of conceived space, if I want to use the word of Lefebvre, that has very little opportunities to be lived and appropriated and experienced. So that, that's a space that, if I want to be you know, a radicalist, that's a space that needs to be completely reconceived to be uh, to be appropriated by people like we'd, we'd like to do. It's easier to do that in terms of, of this. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And now I think we have the final question by Yumna. It's about Zaytuna Bay uh, as an example. Uh, she asks, when is it supposed to return to the public sector knowing that it's rented? Um, I don't know if you can tell us. Uh, tell us more about the management of the area. If you know. I'm not very you. sure if it should be returned. I might, I might not be aware of this. Uh, as far as I know, this is a privatized, you know, yacht port where rich people park their boats, and they have a club at the side where they can go rest uh, while I don't know, waiting for their boats to be fueled or whatever. Uh, so I'm not sure it's supposed to return to the public and they have this, you know, where we go and walk, which is open to the public, but where we're not supposed, I mean, where we're prevented from doing a million things. So it's a public space that's very much securitized and controlled. What's interesting is that the space next to it, adjacent to Zaytune Bay, is supposed to include a park. And that was something we really wanted to work on at the time of the uprisings. Uh, Beirut Madinati was ex exploring that possibility. Uh, there's a huge piece of land there, which used to be the dump of the Normal, which is a waste dump of Beirut at the time that was reclaimed by Solidar. You know, Solidar reclaimed one third of its area from the sea. And this area of land is supposed to be a public park for the city of Beirut, and it's almost as big as Harish Beirut, I think, by surface area. And so they did nothing to develop it and to turn it into a park. And this information is a little known by, by people. If you look at the master plan of Solidaire, you would see that there's a green sort of rectangle next to uh, Zaytune Bay. And that's the park I'm referring to. So that's supposed to go back to the public. And that's a campaign that 
should be in the making at some point of reclaiming these sections of Solidaire back. All the network of public spaces of Solidaire are public spaces where uh, that are to be reclaimed by the public. There's also a heritage trail that's connected to these public spaces that are all open to the public, but they're mostly securitized militarized and it's really hard to use them and not pleasant because there's nothing happening around them, around them. There are no shops, there are nobody. Public spaces are meaningful when you have actions around them and things to look at. If they're just an empty public space, I mean, you go, you spend in there 10, 15 minutes and you move. There's nothing much to see. So, um, so yes, that, that would be my two cents about, uh, about Solidaire and Zaytuni. Yes. So from, I will try to answer her. From what I know, Zaytuna was sold to suffer the nut rent for like 10 million. And the only two spaces that, uh, sorry, there, the only two public spaces are the garden and the, the coastline, uh, the coastline of Normandy, which have this small like wave breaker and spaces in it. And like both of them are like, uh, are not done. The coastline have some security problem. So, uh, but uh, Solidar is trying to give them because it's cheaper uh, not to have to protect it. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, so I guess uh, this concludes our questions from the audience. We don't have any more. Ah, okay, there's one final one. Uh, yeah, Larry. Okay, the final one. Do you think the uprisings allowed us to reclaim, uh, even if temporarily, uh, the restricted areas? Do you think the uprising should take more the shape of an occupation? Um, what about creating alternative economies within those spaces? So people can freely exist. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question, Marianne. Thanks for asking that. I wanted to, to talk a bit about, you know, this uh, these uh, temporary moments of occupation in downtown Beirut in these spaces where you felt that another city is possible. And I'm sure many of us felt that way there. And uh, for a moment, it felt really amazing to be able to imagine that other urban life, that other city. And I think I wanted to say that, and thank you for giving me the to do. I really to speak about the power of urbanism and urban planning to allow us to imagine and envision other realities, other possibilities of life in a place. Uh, urbanism and urban planning does that because it's about, you know, other urban realities, other, other built environments, other regional environments as well, other natures, other, other uh, natural environments. And I think that gives a lot of fuel for political mobilization when you're able to dream and imagine another place, another reality, you are driven by more force and energy to continue the struggle and continue mobilizing because you are able to, to think that uh, I think Lefebvre says it very well, that another urban reality is possible. And um, again, you know, Henri Lefebvre is the, the theoretician of the role of urban space and revolutions. He has a beautiful book called The Urban Revolution, and he thinks that there cannot be a revolution if it's not urban. If it's not about exactly what you're asking, if it's not about reclaiming space, if we do not go and reclaim our right to live the city according to what he calls our heart's desires, like we want to live it. And that's, you know, the, the essence for him of the urban revolution. So what happens during the uprising was very important in that sense, because we enacted that desire of using the city as our hearts want, as our bodies wanted appropriate the space for no and no relation to capital and no relation to consumption as you're very rightly saying being there as a group as a as a community as a collective talking with people we don't know about issues that matter that are substantive so that was 
extremely important in, in that moment of revolution. And I think this will have a repercussion on many mobilizations to come because it's it was a very important affected moment that brought a lot of people together. And when I talk about it, I become very emotional and I'm sure a lot of people, and I thought, thank you for sending me a heart, Lara, that other people feel the same. These were moments that are anchored in our bodily experiences per se. And I really think that this is, essential to, to repeat again and again, even if we have difficulty to do it under the present conditions of total despair and hopelessness we're living, you know, but there will be a time when we will be able to do it again. And, you know, maybe now the time is not to do this same thing. Currently, this is not really the device that works keeping organizing, keeping these conversations going, keeping supporting each other in these times of extreme challenging collapses and crises we're living. Maybe this is, you know, the period of time we need to endure before we we, we re-experiment with other devices and other modalities. There are no other ways. And the 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 urban dimension of the struggle, the spatial dimension of the struggle is an integral part of it. it can, we, if we don't reclaim downtown Beirut, if we don't take it back, it and the sidewalk, which is occupied next to us by I don't, a, a generator, we will, this is all part of the same struggle from the micro to the macro. It's the same exact struggle of bringing back space, and I'm talking about space in the abstract, so even political space, social space, and space itself, physical space, to people. So people become the center of decision making, not, uh, you know, a small group of people who would, uh, of, uh, you know, pol a political elite, self-proclaimed political elite that would decide on our behalf how we should live in the city or work or reside or uh, move and navigate our everyday life. I don't know how clear this is all. I'm tired, I think, but I guess you got the, the gist of it. Uh, we did, uh, thank you so much. And uh, I think this was a perfect uh, last question for our talk today, because you talked about like this uh, speck of hope and a call for action, which is amazing. So um, we want to ask you if you have any final words for us before we conclude the session, maybe. Well, just to keep up the fight and not to not to lose. Uh, I mean, it's hard to keep. I don't. I used to say a lot of the word hope a few years ago. Now I stopped. I find it too difficult to express that. But just to to be able to stay afloat these days is very important. So stay connected and give each other strength. I hope we go through this dark tunnel with the least damage possible, and we can the struggle and keep organizing as everyone is trying to do, I'm sure, at least around this room. So uh, thank you very much. And um, let's uh, keep it up collectively. Thank you so much, uh, Anjad, for this amazing discussion. And thank, thank you, you for, for having me. It was a pleasure.